unmute and share the screen. Is that working? Looks good. Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. And I just have to quickly say hi to Jacob and Lena, my little niece and nephew who are looking in from um, Arizona. That's where they are. Anyway, okay. So we're starting 2021 off and I have to say it's a wonderful year for cavers because it's the international year of caves and karst. And we'll hear more about that later on. Uh, hopefully this year, I'd like, maybe I'll give another talk about caves in general, but it's the year of caves and karst. And it's, if you have a chance to ever go to a, uh, any kind of a cave, you should do it. So, okay, well, let's try to get this, oops, let's get going here. Um, hang on, there. So cave diving for scientific treasure. I could have called this how a farm girl from Indiana found the world's most exciting crustacean, uh, because that's exactly what I did clearly by accident. But I have to say that the talk has to begin with the ice ages, because the ice ages are responsible for the caves that I've been diving in. So if you know anything about ice ages, when there's a lot of ice covering the planet and especially North America, sea level dropped. And all of this that you see here is exposed land all around the continent and the Bahamas, which are right here, I'll show you in a minute, were also exposed. So if this talk is made possible by the ice age. So here's the Bahamas, that's what got it all started. I actually went to Freeport on vacation and ended up living there for over 10 years. And that's when I got started cave diving. And what is so exciting about sea level and the Bahamas and everything is all of this light color that you see here, this is called the Little Bahama Bank. This is the Great Bahama Bank. These, these are shallow water carbonate banks. In other words, these are big, huge hunks of limestone. And when sea level goes up and down, it affects the limestone because limestone is very porous and it's very erodible. And here's another view from outer space of the Bahama Banks. Up here is Freeport. This is Grand Bahama Island. And this is Abaco, no, this is Andros. And so the islands of the Bahamas, there's over 700 islands in the Bahama chain. What you see is just the very tops of these huge carbonate banks. So to get a better schematic of it, if you can imagine that this is one of those big, huge Bahama banks, and here's present day sea level. Down here are older, deeper caves. And those older, deeper caves didn't form except when sea level was lower because caves can't form and especially decorations will not form uh, in water. The stalactites and stalagmites only form in, in air. So you can see where there's these older, deeper caves that clearly indicates that sea level was once lower. Well, there's three basic kinds of caves that we were diving. One is called a blue hole, and that's got an open uh, ocean floor, an opening in the ocean floor. Another one is called an anchialine cave, and that simply means near the sea. And so it has a surface opening on land. And then the third kind, which is actually nothing more than an anchialine cave, except it's just got a different name in Mexico. They call them cenotes, and that came from the Mexican I mean, from the Mayan word zenote, which means well. Here is a blue hole, an ocean blue hole. You can see it's on the floor of the ocean. And if just imagine sea level going down and it would just, you could walk right to it and, and uh, jump right into it. But that's an ocean blue hole. And this is what we call an anchialine cave, which means it has surface opening inland, but subsurface connections to the sea which means that either you could swim from this cave opening out into the ocean or a fish could, depends on the size of the passage, but without a doubt, seawater can trickle in through that porous limestone so that a lot of these caves have deeper salt water, which I'm gonna to get to in a minute. Here are the wells, you can see the wells. Um, and this was one in Mexico and people get their fresh water because fresh water is higher up on the, water table, people get their fresh water, but if you were to jump into that well, it would probably lead to uh, a passageway and a lot of, of cave underneath it. 
This is a, a well-like entrance in the Bahamas and the, this looks just like a pond, but it's actually a cave. Once you get in it, you swim underneath that big limestone ridge and you're in a, a big submerged cave, a big water-filled cave. To make this a little clearer, here is the opening of the cave and then you have fresh water floating on top of heavier salt water. This area right in the middle is called the halocline or I prefer to call it density interface and I'll explain that in a minute. All of these caves are in limestone and the caves are near the coast. That's not to say that there aren't other caves inland um, with water in them, but the caves that I dive and, and where I've been finding all these animals are ones that are close enough to be uh, close enough to the ocean to have salt water underneath them. So here's Lukaya National Park. This is where it all began in the Bahamas. Uh, it's now a national park. When we first started cave diving, it was just a, a, a hole in the ground and we called it Ben's Cave because of the first person who uh, started diving in it. And then it, there's two parts to this. There's Ben's Cave and what we call the Burial Mound Cave where they actually found remains of some Lucayan Indians. So this is um, where it all began and um, it, it has led me to have an incredible life. Uh, this is from the inside of Ben's Cave looking out towards the entrance. And this is the type locality for Rimipedia, which I'm going to explain obviously soon here. Beautiful cave. And you can see once again, these huge stalactites, stalagmites, gigantic columns only formed when that cave was dry. Now it's full of water. And most of the caves in the Bahamas, if you want to go uh, see any of the caves, you have to be a cave diver. So talking about that density interface, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is the first picture I think you're ever taken of a density interface. And the diver is down in the salt water here. This little line is a very distinct line. That's, that's the interface. And then this, which looks like air, is actually fresh water. So you've got the lighter fresh water floating on top of the denser salt water. And again, you can see that this is just full of cave decorations, but you have to swim to, to see them. But back to this density interface, I'm going to explain that in a little more detail about what that is and why I just don't call it just only a halocline. Here is an example of the salinity. Now, when you get down deep in the cave, that salinity is very, very stable. And up at the surface where you have fresh water, that's very stable also. And then this is an area of the density interface, which can change up and down a little bit with tides. It can also change a little bit based on um, surface conditions. For example, if there's a hurricane or if, there's a, if it's the rainy season, that will change this a little bit. But once you get down deep beneath that density interface in the cave, everything is very stable. So this is the salinity. Dissolved oxygen is another amazing phenomenon that these animals are living down here in, the, in these yellow and pink areas where there is less than one milligram of uh, dissolved oxygen. I mean, it's just nearly anoxic. The upper, the surface area, you can see changes. Again, that depends on the weather. But once you get down beneath that density interface, everything is very, very stable. That's to the dissolved oxygen. Temperature, again, very stable once you get into the cave. The surface temperature fluctuates if it's summer, spring, fall, whatever. But once you get into the cave, caves have very stable conditions. This is a mind-boggling photo also. This is another example of that density interface. That you would think that that diver is crawling in air, but that she's not. She's swimming. Her feet and her, her body are up in the fresh water, and then that's the salt water down below. So it's an amazing phenomenon. And again, it has to do with salinity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and also even the pH. This is, the, <laughs> this is one of my dive logs. This is one of my crude little dive logs, but this is the very first Rimipede officially recorded. It was in February 4th, 1979, when I was diving with my partner, Dennis Williams, and we did a, a tour of, of the cave called the Grand Tour. And I just said a few things like the visibility was incredible that day. And then I said, I saw several white millipedes in the, in gar in the garden. That was an area of the cave. 
And then I said, is it a larval stage of something? And then I drew a little crude picture of it. And I said, very invigorating super dive. And that was it. Then the very first rimipede was collected. Um, we collected it in October. So the first one that was ever seen was in February. And it took us until diving lots and lots of times. But it took us until October to get the very first one. And I have to say, of all the caves I've been diving in, Lucayan Cavern has the least number of rimipedes in it. And so it was just serendipitous that I even found one. Um, but anyway, there's the first little proof. So I decided I better do something about it. At that time, I was working on my master's degree at Florida Institute of Technology and flying home on the weekends to cave dive. And uh, I thought, well, if I'm risking my life getting these animals, I'm gonna describe this animal. So it turned out to be a new class of crustacean from, from the Bahamas. And um, it was, well, you just don't find a new class. You can find a new species, a new genus, a new family, a new order, but finding a new class was pretty incredible. And I was just a, I say, I was just a lowly high school biology teacher with the world's most exciting crustacean. And then from then on, it went, it went better and better because with that, um, discovery, we just kept diving more and more caves and finding more animals. Well, this is a rimipede, and it has a very small head and a long trunk, and the long trunk is divided, very segment, very segmented, and every segment, almost every segment, has a pair of these paddle-like feet. So I call the name rimipedia, the class rimipedia, which means paddle foot. So this is the head, it's got long antennas, there's some feeding appendages, three main appendages, which I'm gonna show you in a minute, which is how they grasp their prey. But the yellow color is, is in the gut and it's from um, what they eat. And uh, it's a very cave adapted animal. It doesn't have any pigmentation, has no eyes. It's completely blind. Um, and I'll get into a few more of those adaptations in a minute. Well, this is one that I named called Godzillius robustus, and I named it that because it was the biggest one we've ever found. It's about as big as maybe my, my index finger, um, a huge rimipede. And these are the three feeding appendages I was talking about. These are designed to grab their prey. And uh, you've got to remember, if you, if you close your eyes in your house and think that you have a peanut butter sandwich hidden somewhere in your house, you have to be able to find it. How are you gonna find it? It's dark, there's not one bit of light in these caves. So these animals have really good sense of smell and they have very good sense of touch. So they can feel their way, they smell their way through the water and they can find mates and they can find their food. And all of these little ribbon-like things here are uh, designed to help them smell. These are chemosensory, they detect chemicals in the water. But keep in mind these three big feeding appendages because um, that's how I tell one species from another. And you, you can see that these, this one is huge. This is the first maxilla, it's gigantic. The second maxilla and the maxillopet, and then you can see this little tiny thin arm. Imagine that you have your bicep and then you have a, a, an arm and at the end of that arm you have a claw and that's how they uh, manipulate their food. Well here's another one. Look how different that is from the one previously. This is Pleomothra apletochiles and it's got this huge giant first maxilla with these little with this little tiny fang and these funny looking little shaving brush things on them and then these little candlestick-like things on them. And again, these are all for sensory. These are sensory apparatuses, but we don't know why. I mean, I have no idea what those little shaving brush-like things are doing right here, why they have it, um, what's the function of these sensory that look like candlesticks. There's many, many questions about the biology of these rimipedes that we just don't know even yet. And it's been you know, many, many years since the first one was discovered. Well, when you find a new species, what do you do? You have to uh, draw it very carefully and describe it, how many segments, how many, uh, well, what the feeding appendages look like, blah, blah, blah. There's all kinds of things that you have to do. And then you have to submit it and have it peer reviewed. And then if, if your reviewers say, okay, it's fine, then you publish it. 
And here's one of the ways that you can tell one species from another. These are again, those claws on the end of the feeding appendages. Just imagine your arms. And you can see that they differ quite a bit. So these, this is just one character that I use in describing one species from another. Again, they've got these really incredible claws for grasping their prey. And I'll show you what they eat in a minute here. This is one that just, when I saw it, it just kind of blew my mind because again, what on earth are these little pads on this animal? Why does it have these pads? And they look like Velcro. So my question is, is this animal grasping something that's really slippery and so it has these pads to hold onto it? I mean, is it eating something really big like a big giant blind cave fish? I mean, I, I just don't know what these are for. Um, and I don't know whether we'll ever know because um, you can't just go into a cave and find all these species. This Cryptocornese haptodiscus is pretty rare. It's only found in a, a few caves in the Bahamas. And um, we haven't been able to keep them alive for very long. And it's just a, it's, it's just a mysterious animal still after all these years. Well, this is the part that really was amazing to me is I knew that these animals were grasping their prey and injecting them with something. Because if you look at this, you can see right here, these are some glands that are in the body and the glands go through this duct. The, the, the venom comes out this duct. There's a reservoir, a, I call it a poison reservoir. And then here are the fangs. And so this animal is actually injecting this toxin into a shrimp. And you know how shrimp can wiggle around. So it's injecting the prey with this toxin, which immobilizes it, and it also pre-digests it. And I never had a chance to figure out what it was because at the time, there, these animals were still really rare. Well, they still are. And so if at the time, if I wanted to figure out what that toxin was, I'd have to really collect a lot of these animals, and I just didn't want to do it. But now things have gotten a lot better, and so um, people have been able to analyze this in 2013, they could take a tiny, tiny picogram of this venom. And it turns out that it's a pretty unique toxin. Um, and I'm probably pretty glad that these animals aren't bigger than they are because I would never want to take a chance of being bitten by one because it's a peptidase, it's a lot of enzymes and then a neurotoxin. So it's, it's got a good punch. And there you can see how it is. There's that fang that injects the prey with the, with the uh, toxin. And every rimipede has a fang. Uh, they all, I mean, they're all using that fang and they're all producing this toxin. And um, that's one of the ways that they eat. But there's, what they eat is also up in the air. We're still, there's still kind of controversy about do they always just eat other crustaceans in the cave or are they eating bacteria or what's going on? What's that? connection in this cave. Well, I also looked at the reproduction and life cycle. These animals are hermaphroditic, which means that they have a male and female uh, parts on, on one single animal. And this picture here on the left is a uh, transmission electron micrograph of the sperm. This is the part on the feet at the female end of the animal where the sperm, I would assume, gets injected. We don't know what happens. We do know that there are little baby rimipedes down here. The eggs hatch and they go through a, a series of, of molts. Uh, but how does the, you know, what happens to the eggs when they're fertilized? We don't know where they go. Do they stay on the body? Do they stay, I mean, it, there's just a lot of questions. But my speculation is, here's that fang at the end of some of those appendages. And it's the same measurement as the female, the female gonopore, so maybe they, when they mate, they're taking that sperm and kind of stuffing it in there, but I, we don't know. There's uh, more questions. Well, this is also very interesting. There's some talk by biologists, and that question is, are crustaceans the insects of the sea? Well, now people are beginning to think that the insects are the crustaceans of land, and they're looking at these rimipedes, and they're saying, well, now wait. These rimipedes may have something to do or may clearly be a sister group of insects. So this is a big controversial thing. People are looking at all kinds of molecular, molecular work. Um, I'm not 
uh, since I've retired and the molecular stuff has kind of passed me by, but I think it's fascinating that, that people are really interested in thinking that these rimipedes are a possible sister group for the insects or the, or the hexapods. Well, there's another picture of a rimipede. You can see again, here's that head with those with those feeding appendages and the claw and the claws and the um, injector, the fang, and then that long, long trunk and lots of swimming legs. When it swims in the cave, it does these beautiful loops and rolls, and it, it's just a gorgeous animal to watch live in the cave. I should have put some footage of that in here. Oh well. Anyway, so let's keep on looking at what these caves and, and what you see, there's always this orange sediment, which also matches the orange color sometimes in the gut of these rimipedes, which makes you wonder, are they eating something that's eating the sediment? Or are they in fact eating the sediment? There's still some questions. Because when you look at their gut, the gut is just a, a soup. It's just this amorphous soup. You don't see little particles of anything in it. So they digest whatever they're eating really well. So what else lives in these caves? There is a, a, an associated fauna in almost every cave. It's, it's nearly the same thing. If you find uh, some of these little animals, you're probably gonna find um, rimipedes. But let's start out at the base of the, of the um, food chain, and that is this chemosynthetic bacteria. Bacteria that are able to live taking chemicals out of the seawater for their energy source. And a lot of these bacteria are what we call extremophiles, which means they're able to live in sulfur caves, they're able to live in hot springs, they're able to live in these really extreme conditions. And so there's a lot of study going on right now about cave bacteria and how that might relate to um, bacteria that we might find on other planets. What kind of extremophiles can we find? If we find extremophiles here, that would be a good case to say, well, there's probably extremophiles living on some of these planets. So this is an example of a sulfur bacteria, huge colonial bacteria that just floats in the water and then also makes mats. Then you'll always find a community of crustaceans. These caves, water-filled caves are just full of crustaceans, little tiny ones. These are, they look big, but they're, you know, maybe two to 10 millimeters at the most. This right here is a, a specific shrimp, and that's the one that lives in uh, the caves the most with these rimipedes. And I'm pretty sure that these rimipedes, well, I know they are, they're eating this particular shrimp right here, and probably these other uh, crustaceans that you see here. What I want you to see here is how these uh, crustaceans are so well adapted to living in a cave. If you think about a shrimp that you eat, or you see out in the ocean if you're, if you're diving, this animal is clearly living in a cave, doesn't have but just a tiny few little flecks of pigmentation. And then you can see this orange gut material. It's probably gonadal material, it could be eggs. And then here's some of the gut going back here like here. And then long, long appendages with lots of little CT on them for feeling, huge long antennas, no eyes. This is where the eye would be. So this is a clearly a cave adapted troglobitic animal, stig stigobiont, there's lots of names for them now, but this is an animal, a shrimp that lives in a cave and is well adapted to live in the dark. It doesn't have any problem without having eyes. It, it can sense and smell real well in the water. Well, this is a blind cave fish. We do have blind cave fish. Probably the only thing that would eat a rimipede is a blind cave fish. And this one is a very pregnant blind cave fish. This is one that we took a picture of in Lucayan Cavern. They are live bearers, um, which makes a lot of sense if you live in a cave. A cave is a pretty food poor environment. And so you wanna bring forth your offspring pretty well developed um, rather than just lay eggs um, like some fish do. So this is a live bearer. Then I noticed, which is very interesting, is it's like a dog has fleas. Well, rimipedes have fleas. These little things right here live on the outside of these rimipedes. These little balls here are also called ectoparasites. And then in this orange colored rimipede, there's all these little red spots. And to this day, I still don't know what those red spots are. Um, uh, probably some kind of a parasite living within the animal tissue, but um, 
there's just a lot more questions that we have and there's nobody studying these animals. So I'm hoping that maybe I can get some graduate students somewhere someday interested in continuing this work. Well, these are pictures, again, my background is from this same exact cave. This is a cave in Abaco in the Bahamas and um, that's a water filled cave. There's cave divers in that. You can see the line. Um, it's the water in these caves are, it's just crystal clear for the most part. And the decorations are astonishing. Again, only formed when, they're, when the cave was dry. So after finding all these rimipedes in the Bahamas, we decided to start looking other places. And so we went to Cuba and we've been, I've been going to Cuba now quite a few times, several expeditions in Cuba. And this was one that I was on in 1994 when we actually found a rimipede. And um, we were very excited. I still, I was just there in February for a conference then, and I gave a talk with a Cuban friend of mine about the US-Cuban relationships in the cave, caving community. And they're very strong, they've been very strong, and especially in the cave diving community. So what happened with that? A new species, Spelionectus heronensis. And Heron, Playa Heron is where it's down in the southern coast of Cuba, and it's where the bay, close to where the Bay of Pigs is, if you know your your Cuban biology. But anyway, uh, we found a new species, and so I called it Speleonectus heronensis. Oh, Speleonectus means cave swimmer. And that's the fun thing is when you describe these species, you can give them their names. So cave swimmer from the Heron area. Well, then after finding them in Cuba, people started finding them in Mexico, in the Yucatan Peninsula, in the state of Quintana Roo. And uh, it was so exciting down there that Bill and I decided to buy a house. And after I retired from Antioch, we moved down there and lived there for about 10 years. And I'll, you'll see why we chose to go down there because there's some pretty exciting news coming up. So what, what's going on in these caves? In the caves in the Yucatan Peninsula, we're getting all kinds of information now. We've got uh, skeletal remains that prove that some of these people have been occupying the Yucatan Peninsula for thousands and thousands of years earlier than people thought. Um, so this is uh, some examples of that. This is again taken in water. This is taken by a, one of my cave diving partners, Geronimo Aviles, and he took this, it's in water. And in fact, some of these bones are so calcified when the cave was dry and water was still dripping in, it, it covered it with, with uh, limestone decorations. And so you sometimes you have to take a huge part of that to get some of the skeletal remains to study them. So not just that, here's some Mayan pottery that is way back in a cave. So how did it get way back in a cave? Probably when the cave was dry, which uh, the last ice age, it was much when the sea level was lower, 10,000, 14,000 years ago. So these caves are really now giving us lots of information about early settlers in some of these areas. And here's Hieronimo. He's also been finding bones of animals. And one of them lately is a new species of giant ground sloth living in, these, uh, living in the area. So uh, these underwater caves are giving us all kinds of information. But this is the one why we bought the house down there and moved because this cave is extraordinary. It doesn't look like much, but when you get inside of it, oh, and here I am going, oh gosh, am I gonna go into this cave again today? Uh, and you can see all the gear that you have to put on, but once you get in, it's well, well worth it because this cave literally, and this is the truth, the first time I went diving in this cave, I started crying in my mask because I have never seen so many rimipedes in my life. I mean, 10 years of diving Lucayan, maybe I saw 15 rimipedes total. This is the first time I was diving in this cave and they were everywhere. And you can see there's an example of me holding a little bottle of them uh, from that same exact cave. But yeah, mind boggling. So my, my partner, Mike and I, I got a Fulbright fellowship to, to study it for a whole year. And we dove all, just we just dove constantly. And 
Here's an example right here that you can see on one dive, we counted nearly 18, well, 17, uh, almost 1,800, 1,800 rimpies on one dive. And that was only, we would swim following a line and I would count everything on the right side of the line. He would count everything on the left so side of the line. Not, and we were not allowed to look in the distance. We could only see what was within that area. So that was nearly 1,800 rimapedes and probably 1,800 more. It was unbelievable how many there are in this cave. And a lot of these caves are highly endangered because of all of the uh, construction going on now because people want to go to Cancun and these caves are in the same state as this uh, word of Cancun and Playa del Carmen are and there's so much coastal development. I don't even know what's going on at this cave right now. I'm hoping that somebody's preserving it. When I talked to the owner and I said, you know, I said, would you consider selling this, the land above the cave? And he said, yes. I said, how much? He said, a million dollars. So that was the end of that. Well, where are we today? We still don't know much about these rimapedes at all, but at the, the mother load of them, you could say, is in the Caribbean area. This area right here, we've got over, it's now over 24 species. And because of molecular work, um, they've been split into new genera and new families. Um, I can hardly keep up with it because people are going nuts with molecular biology. And uh, someday maybe I'll try to meld all the molecular biology with the actual physical descriptions of them just to make sure that the molecular biology is correct. But anyway, we've got at least 20, well, over 24 species in this area right here. The Bahamas, mostly a couple of species in Cuba and a couple of species in the Yucatan Peninsula here. Oh, and also in the Dominican Republic. I forgot, we also have one or two new species from the Dominican Republic. Then there's two species for sure living in the uh, Canary Islands, Lanzarote in, in the Canary Islands. And then there's one species known on the Western coast of Australia. So it's got an incredible distribution. Now we have looked in the, um, I have, and I didn't get, get to go on these expeditions, but um, they've looked in the Pacific and not found the caves that have rimapedes in them. Uh, if I were to guess, I would, I would look over here in the uh, Horn of Africa area, Yemen and Socotra and all these areas right here, but that's too dangerous to go. Maybe the coast of Brazil somewhere or, or I mean the coast of South America, hard to say, but um, everywhere we look in the Bahamas, we're finding new species, which is um, pretty amazing. And every single cave on, nearly every single cave has its own group of endemic species, which is clearly true of most caves anywhere. Um, you have high levels of endemism in these caves. So there's a fabulous photo by a friend of mine of a rimipede, probably the best picture I've ever seen of one. It just, it's just so beautiful. Uh, and that's what caused me to leave teaching high school and get my PhD and teaching at Antioch College. And I still do a little bit of research at Smithsonian, although we've been locked out now for over a year. So I don't have no idea when we're gonna get to go back. Um, but it's just been a, an amazing ride for this little farm girl from Indiana. And it's been, it's been wonderful. So why study caves? If you look at these ologies, every single ology that you see here can take place in a cave. You can look at the life in caves, the biospeleology. You've seen uh, Mayan pottery and skeletal remains taking for the, and, and the animals. So you've got archeology, span paleontology, and then these extremophiles, the microbiology is amazing to study that. We need more people studying them in, in these submerged caves. Limnology, that freshwater level, what's living in the freshwater layer? Oh, by the way, I, I was very curious about these rimapedes and I took one from the, salt, from the salt layer and I put it up in the freshwater. I took it over the density interface and I put it up in the freshwater and it literally just kind of freaked out and went swimming right back down into the uh, salt water. So they aren't, we're not gonna find them in the freshwater layer. Um, we've never found any in the deep sea. 
So we don't know where their closest relatives are. Um, there's been some fossil rimipedes found, although I don't know how they can call them rimipedes because they were so squashed, but fine, that's okay with me because it pushes their age back to something like 350 million years. Um, but um, there's just many questions. Water chemistry, hydrology, which way is the um, water moving in these caves? Um, these caves, by the way, in the Yucatan Peninsula are the source of fresh water. It, it's a huge freshwater aquifer that the entire Yucatan Peninsula depends on for their drinking water. So as sea level rises, if sea level happens to rise with global warming, then that's going to push that freshwater layer up even higher so that there's less fresh water available. Uh, so there's a lot of things that have to be taken into account when you're looking at global climate changes and hydrology is one of them. Invertebrate zoology, obviously these crustaceans, blind cave fish vertebrates, people are looking at population genetics, describing new species, biogeography, what lives in Australia doesn't live in the Bahamas, but it's very closely related, why? And then obviously the evolution of these animals. So why study caves? There's such scientific potential in nearly every biological, scientific, physics, you name it, field, except astronomy. But that link is then with the extremophiles. But anyway, it's an amazing place to, to study. And when you think of a cave now, I hope that you think of all the research potential, that it's not just a cave, it's, it's a, a laboratory. So with that, again, I'm a member of the NSS, the National Speleological Society. We explore, we study, and we protect. And I'll end with, do you have any questions? Thank you. Now, let's see, do I do something? Go ahead and stop sharing your screen, uh, Jill. Okay. We have a bunch of questions from the chat. Okay, I hope I can answer them. Yeah, uh, but but Jill, thank you first of all for an amazing talk. Uh, I'm a huge fan of remipedes before, uh, huge fan <laughs> of remipedes now, I wasn't before, I didn't know anything about them, but it's just tremendous. Let me, let me just start from the earliest questions and go to the later ones and then we can open up for everyone else. Uh, we had a question early on about how big are the remipedes. You showed a scale uh, for that particular spe that particular um, uh, specimen. Is there a range for the size of the remipedes? Yeah, the the smallest one is Godzillianomus frondosus. I love these names, uh, and that's about maybe about as big as your thumb fingernail, the thumbnail. Maybe maybe nine millimeters. I should get my ruler out here. Yeah, here we go. So I don't know if you can see that. So if you can see where nine millimeters is, that's the smallest one. And then the largest one is maybe about 50 millimeters. It's about like that. So it's about, about like my finger, a little bit less. But so they range in size. Each each species is slightly has a slightly different number of segments and a slightly different length. Great, thank you. Uh, the other question was, are remipedes found in other locations besides the Bahamas? You covered that, so mm -hmm. a few other places. Uh, where in the water column are the remipedes found? Are they in the They're, benthos? Oh, the benthos meaning the bottom. That's interesting because most of the caves, they've been swimming only in the water column, but that one cave I showed you in Mexico, they've been, they had a close association with the bottom. You'd find some of these remipedes, it was really fun. You'd find some of them sleep, well, on the bottom, laying on the bottom, and they'd be just like they were sleeping on the bottom. And then you'd watch them carefully and they were cleaning their antennas. They were doing all kinds of things. And then when I kept some of them alive in an aquarium, they made a little hole in the sediment. And I don't know, I don't know what they were doing, but so yes, they're, some of them are associated with the benthos, but they are basically because of their beautiful swimming legs and all those uh, uh, swimming appendages on the trunk, they're mostly in the water column. Wonderful. Uh, Elisa has a, a comment and a question here. Uh, invertebrates are so amazingly understudied. I'm so glad you're sharing this work with us. Are there efforts to use uh, eDNA e and techniques like meta barcoding to characterize remipede diversity at these sites and elsewhere? Ooh, wow. <laughs> the, 
No, the answer to that is no, but they are using those techniques to decide whether there are uh, blind cave fish in some caves, but nobody's done anything with remipedes at all, ever, so far. Wow. Wow. That's so sad. <laughs> yeah. We need more biologists. We need more students. I mean, we really do need more grad students because these are some fascinating questions. Are, are they well represented in GenBank or do you, do you know like if there are some? I think most of these species have been uh, analyzed. They've been, they've, they're barcoded or whatever. See, I can't even speak the language, <laughs> but yeah, they, they are. But now the problem is all of the ones that I collected, which you can't even find now. I mean, you have to, you'd have to go into a cave and with luck, find some of these species again. I collected long before anybody was doing any genetic work. Most of mine I fixed in formalin and you can't use formalin to do any kind of genetic work and get anything accurate. So you'd have to go back, you have to go back cave diving and then collect them and put them in um, alcohol. So. Wow. Thanks, Jill. You're welcome. Uh, a, few, a few other questions here. Uh, do you know the lifespan? What's the lifespan for them? Nope, don't know a thing. Um, I kept them alive in a, in a small aquarium when I was living in Mexico. The longest I kept them alive was for four months. But, but I know that the problem was, well, actually when the four months was up and I had to leave, I took them back into the cave. I couldn't kill them because I've been watching them for four months and I just wasn't gonna just, you know, kill them. So I, I put them back in the cave, hope they made it. But anyway, um, they lived successfully. But what I found was, the oxygen level could go up. I kept them dark. The oxygen level I couldn't maintain low, so I just let that go to see what would happen. The only thing that I did, and I didn't even let the temperature, I mean, it got a little bit warmer, a lot warmer actually, but the pH I think was really important because if I didn't change the cave water in my little tiny tank and give them a little bit of new sediment, they're, they're a little seedy, their hairs would get all clogged and they couldn't groom themselves and they couldn't keep all that sediment off of themselves and they died. So um, there's, it's not gonna be easy to keep them alive, I don't think. Here, here's a question from, I think one of our younger participants. Uh, how did you see them when it was so dark and they're so small? Oh, good question. Did that come from Sean, Sean's family? From Jacob and Lena. Yes, from yeah. Lena and Jacob. That's my little niece and nephew. Uh, Great. Good <laughs> question, you guys. Well, the cave is pitch black. There's no light in that cave at all. And so when we go cave diving, we carry very bright lights. So if you imagine turning, I would say if you go to a movie theater, but no one's gone to a movie theater for so long, if you have your house completely dark and you turn on a flashlight, you can see little particles of dust in the, in the air. That's the same way in these caves, the water, well, you can see behind me that water is very clear. So any little teeny animal will show up very well, as long as you don't stir up the sediment. Good question. Great question, yeah. Any, any other questions? Uh, okay, here's another one from uh, Helen. How did you start cave diving? And please describe the experience. Well, when I moved to the Bahamas, I decided to take an advanced diving class, and that was at UNEXO, where Glenn Taylor is, if you see him over here on your screen. Glenn and Dee, they were diving there then, teaching there. So I took an advanced diving class, and I think Glenn was my teacher, weren't you, Glenn? Yes, he was. Okay. And so one of the things we had to do in our advanced class was a specialty dive, and so the people in my class decided we wanted to dive in an ocean blue hole. So my very first ocean blue hole, I went down in this big, huge shaft hole. And at the bottom of this cave, at the very bottom of this big, huge hole was a gigantic moray eel. And if you know anything about moray eels, they're always opening and closing their mouth. It's really scary. And that was my first ocean dive. And I had actually been once in Lucayan before that. Uh, and so then this class, we just decided, hey, there's so many caves and let's start looking at Lucayan. And so we started diving in, in Ben's cave, it was called. And um, then I got my cave certification and there were, we, for the longest time, Ben's cave or Lucayan cavern now was the longest underwater cave in the world. We had people coming from all over, 
uh, our apartment was like a dive camp. We had tanks everywhere. We had gear on the dining room table and we just started cave diving. And then, then when I found some of these animals and they all turned out to be new to science, that's when things really kicked in. And especially when it was a new class, that whole new class just cave divers just started crawling out of the woodwork. And now in Mexico, there's just, it's, it's just too many almost. It, it's, it's amazing. What worries me is when you have so many cave divers and they're all swimming through that density interface, are they mixing the fresh water and the salt water? Is it ever going to get back to normal? I mean, there's the, the, the damage that cave divers can do. And if, the, if you aren't well trained with your buoyancy, you can see behind me how you could knock off these beautiful decorations. So you have to be a buoyancy control expert when you cave dive or otherwise you're gonna just do so much damage. Uh, so what, yeah, did that answer the question, Helen? I got, I got off on this, whatever, but anyway. Yeah, so my first, so diving was just, a, it was just, I mean, I have more di cave dives in my logbook than I have ocean dives. It's just, that's what we did. Really exciting. There, there's a related question here. Could you comment on advances in technology in, uh, to aid cave diving? How has it evolved over the years? Oh, goodness, yeah. <laughs> I should have shown some of the stuff that we used to wear. When I first started cave diving, we dove because my cave diving instructor was working with NASA. I think that's what he was doing. We had these huge, giant Navy 90 tanks that were just, yeah. Everything's changed. We The, the lights, well, when we first started diving, we had homemade lights. Uh, and they ran on these little batteries that you had to charge with your car battery. Um, yeah, and now they're really fancy. And no, the gear has changed like crazy. And also from the beginning when I was diving, from when I started diving in Mexico, sometimes, sometimes the dives in Mexico, we would not only have two tanks on our back, we'd have two tanks on our side called, um, I forget what you call them, spare tanks. That's not what they call them, but, um, what do they call them, Glenn? I forget. Anyway, so you have lots of lots of other air. You use the air in your two tanks, then you have a tank on one side, a tank on another side, so you can stay down much longer. The only problem with that is when you stay down longer, then you have to uh, decompress a lot longer. So one of the things that we didn't have at the beginning that they've changed now is you've got all these mixed gas things. So you can change the gas in your tank to let you stay down longer based on, on the mixture of, it's a um, oxygen, heli, nitrox, it's a nitrox, nitrogen, oxygen, and then they go to heliox. I mean, it's, it's very complicated and it's way beyond me now. I, I would never do that, but yeah, it's, it's very advanced, much better gear, much better gear. A related question is, could you describe some of the dangers of ocean cave diving, like getting lost, for example? Well, I didn't mention that, but that's a good question. You have specific rules when you're a cave diver. One is you always, well, I always dive with at least one other person. Now, if I were to go diving again at my age, I'd want two other people with me because I probably couldn't pull out a partner if I, if I needed to. But anyway, so the rules that you follow, we, the biggest, most important one is the thirds rule. You have a third of your air to go in a third of your air out and a third of your air for your buddy if he or she runs out. So you have to look at your the, the amount of um, air in your tank and make sure that you know when you have to turn the dive. So that's one, you, it's the thirds rule. Then you always have multiple lights. We had the big primary lights and then we always had clipped on our bodies, maybe three or four, five other lights. So you never had to worry about it being dark. And then you always had a reel. So you always have a line going out of the cave so that if when, and then if you decide you wanna ex, uh, explore, you tie onto that line and go off and explore. So you always have a way out. Um, so those are the main rules. If you follow those rules, you it's not bad at all. I've never, I never ever had a problem. My problem was Sometimes if you stir up the silt, you get a little disoriented. So you want to make sure that you don't stir up the silt. But I never had an emergency, nothing ever. I mean, knock on wood, I never had a problem because we always were very, very safe. And you always look at your partner. Where is, where is your partner's air? Where, where is his, his or her lights? 
you know you know your gear and you know your partner's gear so it's it's very safe great uh, another question here from uh, helen uh, is it true you captured that first remipede in a jar and yeah. what happened next who did you contact about your discovery? <laughs> okay, yeah, I just happened to be in there. I had seen them before and thought, well, what are those strange little, I thought they were polychaetes, which are a, a worm, that, an ocean worm, a, a salt, a seawater, saltwater worm. Well, so I got one in a little jar. I took it back, which again, like I said, our house was nothing but dive gear everywhere. And I had microscopes in there and I looked at it under the microscope and I went, well, this isn't a worm, it's a crustacean. I mean, I knew that much biology that I could tell it was a crustacean. And then you have to figure out, well, what class is it in? Is it with the shrimp? Is it with um, what, what's, what's its closest relative? It wouldn't fit. And so that's when I started to write people all over the world, specifically who were studying cave animals. And I'd send them my little crude sketches. And they all would write back, no, nah, don't know what it is. Never, never seen anything like it. And then it dawned on us, hey, you know, you're living in a, I mean, you're diving in a, totally new environment. And so it's probably something new. Wow, it's so exciting. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? You can either unmute yourself and ask the question or type into the chat. Oops, Jenny, are you trying to say something? Oops, she doesn't know how to unmute, maybe. Yeah, she has to unmute herself. <laughs> Oops. There. Can you hear me? Or can I hear you? Jenny, I think yes. you're Yes, can you okay. hear me? <laughs> yes. Bob wants to know how many dives you've made. Oof, I'd have to check my dive log. Uh, hundreds. Hundreds, and that's nothing. I mean, there are people who have done thousands and thousands of dives. So, yeah, I'd say hundreds, but I don't know. And my dive logs, a lot of my dive logs were stolen. I've got a couple of them, but a couple of them were oh. stolen. So, yeah. How, how, how deep are these caves? It depends on the cave, again. Now, the ones in Mexico, the one that I dove that has all these remipedes in it, at the most, and, and I have to say it has to, it's in feet because we use feet in diving instead of meters. And I like it because it's a lot more specific. But anyway, maybe 60 feet. But there was, a, there were a couple of caves I've been in, in uh, Andros Island, which is the biggest island of the Bahamas. And I got down to about 160 feet in there. And then that was it. I said, oh, I'm not going any further because that's way, I mean, when I looked at my, <laughs> my depth gauge, I went, whoa. Time to get up a little higher, but I, I had to stop right there because right in front of me was a remipede. So it's okay, I gotta get it. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so it just depends on the cave system. I'm, I'm curious to know about the ratio of women in cave diving, whether a lot of women cave diving and has it changed over the years? Um, when I first started cave diving, there were maybe in the entire world less than 100 cave divers, I mean, and they were almost all in North Florida. And there were quite a few women who were, who were cave divers. Um, now there's literally thousands of them, especially because of all the diving that's being done in Mexico. And um, of all the cave diving people, there are probably, well, I was the first one to ever get a PhD based on cave diving. Mm. Uh, and I, don't, I don't know that there's been but made a handful since and um, there's just not any cave diving scientists to speak of. There are very, very few. And some women, yeah, I would say there's quite a few. There's a, another Jill out there who's a fabulous cave diver and her name is Jill Heinerth. And she does a lot of work with National Geographic and that woman is fearless. I mean, she does stuff I would never do. So yeah, there's some good, good women divers out there. Luna, oh. Micah, Margo, more family, sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other questions or comments? Uh, 
A lot of great feedback, Jill. People just love the talk. Uh, very inspiring. Uh, a lot of well, enthusiasm. Uh, I, so. I consider myself to be extremely fortunate, and I hope to do another thing on caves since this is the year of the cave. So Please we'll, do, do. we'll do something again. So thank uh, you, everybody, you for checked, joining. I'm uh, sorry, have what? you checked the Galapagos oh. Islands? Oh, I, I haven't personally, but other cave divers have checked the Galapagos, and there's no remipedes there. Oh. There are, I mean, there are caves, there are caves with these crustaceans and everything, but no remipedes. And what is the coldest water they're found in? Is it, are they something that's more of a warm water or yeah. would they possibly be like in Iceland or something like that? I would not think they would be in Iceland unless they were in some kind of a thermal situation. And if there were ever a place to find remipedes in the open ocean, I would think near some of these thermal vents, but no, their, their, their whole distribution is, is warm. It's warm. Good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one. Yes. Uh, I, am I on? Yeah, you're on, Bob. Um, <laughs> okay. What other interesting animals have you seen? You mean in a cave? Yes. Yeah. Well, all these little tiny crustaceans and then the blind cave fish. The, the blind cave fish are really neat. They are, they are so, I mean, they're completely blind, but yet you can put, you can put your hand in front of one like this and they'll turn. They're so tuned to their environment. You can, and you could, you can kind of herd them around because they can feel your hand. So blind cave fish are the coolest of vertebrates, I think. But they're not, I mean, there's, it's mostly crustaceans with a few blind cave fish and a few um, blind eels. And I've never seen a blind eel, although they are on the Yucatan Peninsula, but I've never seen any. Uh, in the ocean blue holes, now there, <laughs> yeah, there's sharks, there's uh, gigantic lobsters there. I mean, the ocean blue holes are completely different because they are ocean, you get ocean creatures in them, so. Hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Helen has another uh, question for her. I think she has to interview you. Uh, was it cave diving that led you to bats? Uh, no, actually, I think it's the other way around. When my, well, here's my cave story. As a little girl living in Indiana, my grandpa took me to a show cave in Southern Indiana, the first show cave I've ever been to called Wyandotte Cave for anybody who's been to Indiana. And when I went into that cave, I saw these decorations. And I thought, wow, how gorgeous. And I saw one little tiny brown bat. And I just, I was just thrilled with that bat. I thought it was so cool. And then when I went to um, undergraduate, when I went to Earlham College in Indiana, one of my biology professors was a bat. He studied bats, Jim Cope, if anybody knows Jim. He was a great biologist. And we used to go on bat banding trips. And so I kind of fell in love with bats. So I was torn as a, as a landlocked farm girl, I was torn between bats or dolphins. Of course, everybody wanted to work with dolphins, <laughs> but yeah. So that was sort of my love of the ocean. And then bats sort of took me into caves and that's it. Well, thank you, Jill. I'm so excited about this talk and there's been great enthusiasm. We look forward to your next one. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. This might be a record number for people uh, uh, joining us for one of these talks. Uh, feel free to check out the uh, meetup page for Asheville Science Tavern. I'll put it in the chat here. Uh, you can look for the link there. Uh, we're gonna post uh, new talks as we get uh, speakers throughout the year. Typically we do them uh, once a month on the second Sunday of uh, every month. So check the meetup site for future announcements. And if you know anyone who might be interested in giving a talk, uh, please feel free to get in contact with us. We'd love to we'd love host someone. And wear your masks, people. Please wear your masks. I want, I want to see my grandkids again. <laughs> and my little nieces and nephews and everybody. So anyway, stay safe. Thanks. Stay safe. Be well, everyone. Thanks Bye, for joining everybody. us tonight. Bye. We'll see you next time. That was great. Thank you.